And it's an honor for me to be here and a distinct pleasure, and I want to thank Dr. Lalani and the rest of the organizing committee for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, in the next 30 minutes, I thought I would review uh, a broad swath of research going on in my lab and also around the world that uh, raises some ethical issues concerning the use of fetal tissue, of uh, stem cells in general, uh, chimeras. Uh, I'll leave the gene editing for uh, uh, Janet Rassant later on, but um, I, I wanted to give you an impression of where we are in the science right now. And um, to do that, I thought I would begin uh, by mentioning that although my work for many years had been in the mouse, oh right, I'm sorry, before I start, I've included a disclosure. Um, I don't usually do this in my talks, but um, uh, sort of an abundance of caution because there's so many ethicists in the room, I thought I should make it clear. <laughs> um, but I did want to talk about the differences between the human uh, brain, for example, and the mouse. And I should also mention that I'm a neurologist, a neuroscientist, and while there are many uh, ethical issues raised by other fields of regenerative medicine, uh, the areas related to the nervous system, I think, uh, are very acutely raising issues that uh, are different from other organ systems. Um, so I wanted to start by highlighting some of the differences in early brain development in humans compared to, say, rodents. And this is the only uh, image of a mouse, I think, that I'm going to show. It's not a real mouse. It's a cross-section of a developing brain in the mouse where the radial glial cells down here at the bottom produce a daughter type of cell called an intermediate progenitor, which lies in a zone just above. And these two areas produce all the neurons and glial cells that populate the brain, all the cell types that's found in the brain. And these two progenitor regions are uh, mitotic, that is, they're proliferating throughout the early stages of, um, of mouse in utero development. In the human, at a very early stages of brain development, it looks very much the same, uh, as shown here in this image. Uh, a cross-section of the human uh, pro progenitor zones at comparable early stages. There are radial glia here at the bottom and there are intermediate progenitors and they're producing the earliest born neurons. But then, over the next few weeks, there's a huge expansion of this zone known as the outer subventricular zone. It's a progenitor region that's not found in the mouse, so it's found in large brain mammals and humans, and it's filled with progenitor cells. And the nature of those cells hadn't really been studied uh, about eight or nine years ago when we first began looking at these. And so we, we were very interested in what kind of cells uh, were producing those neurons in the expanded large brain mammals like uh, humans. And I wanted to show this movie, but uh, let's see. Uh, I hope I can do this. Oh, there we go. Let's try. Is that going to work? Uh, almost. I have this little icon. What should I do? Oops. Oh, here we go. This one's working. Uh, so that zone is filled with these cells, um, which undergo a very peculiar division. They jump and divide. Uh, this is a behavior that hadn't been described before. It seems to be unique to this cell type. And uh, we've referred to it as mitotic somal translocation. And if you didn't notice it before, you can just look at this example. These cells are very distinct in their morphology, their shape, and when they're ready to divide in the brain, they translocate about 100 microns in an hour, which is a pretty big jump, rapid jump for a cell, and then they divide. And that was a behavior that we uh, observed in these cells only, and uh, it allowed us to look for the same cell types in other species, and I'll get to that later on. But what it did tell us was that there's a diversity of cell types in the human brain that we don't find in other species, and in particular in the mice that many of us use in our laboratories. And uh, rather than show you actual data, I thought I'd show you a schematic which highlights the way neurons are produced in the developing mouse brain. And all you really need to know is that there are a variety of different cell types that generate these neurons. But if we look at the human brain, a similar uh, schematic diagram, it's much more complicated. There are many more cell types. There's a higher diversity of progenitors that make the neurons. There's a higher diversity of neurons. They have different uh, local addresses, aerialization, which you don't find in the mouse. And that makes it very difficult to study human diseases that might not be expressed in, in, for example, the brain of a mouse. And I'll highlight a few of those as we go along. In my lab, we've been looking at these cells that are constituting the early developing human brain on a single cell basis. We've been looking at genes that are expressed by individual cell types. And what I'm showing you here is just a way of mapping uh, the expression of genes that are associated with a particular signaling pathway known as the mTOR signaling pathway. And uh, 
I just wanted to highlight that that pathway, it turns out, uh, in humans, but not in, other, in many other species, is enriched in those outer radial glial cells, that particular cell that jumped and divided I showed you before. These cell types are highly expanded in the developing human brain, and they actually produce most of the neurons that are found in the upper layers of the human brain. And it turns out that these cells are enriched in this mTOR signaling pathway gene. And in fact, uh, we're interested in that because the mTOR signaling pathway has been implicated in autism, tuberous sclerosis, macrocephaly. And so these diseases, uh, which may not be able to model them in a mouse uh, because these cell types aren't found in the mouse, I highlight one of the important differences between studies that could be done in humans or human cells compared to model systems that many of us use in a laboratory. Now, fetal tissue has uh, come under, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, quite a bit of, uh, of scrutiny for ethical concerns and, and religious concerns and, I think, ideological reasons. And as many of you know, in uh, June, just a few days ago, um, there was a, uh, a, a decree, essentially, from the White House which banned the use of uh, fetal tissue for internal NIH laboratories and also one of the laboratories at UCSF, uh, which had a 30-year-long contract with the NIH, uh, that was stopped just this month um, for this ban. Uh, luckily, it's still possible to do fetal tissue research with NIH funding in extramural institutions like ours at UCSF, um, but, but we don't know for sure if that'll continue, and there's a new level of scrutiny uh, for all those research projects. Um, so with that in mind, I wanted to highlight some of the benefits that have accrued from the study of fetal tissue just in the last few years, and I thought I'd start with one of the projects in my lab, and it has to do with this epidemic of Zika-induced microcephaly that was present in Brazil uh, in 2015. Uh, at first, it wasn't clear exactly whether the virus was causing microcephaly or, in fact, how that was happening, and so uh, we started a study based on human fetal tissue that we, were, we had access to, and it had to do with the way the virus enters the body. Uh, the mosquito, when it bites you, introduces the virus, which uh, affects skin and blood cells through a receptor pathway mediated by this receptor called AXL. And our single cell data showed that the AXL receptor was highly enriched in the progenitor cells, those outer radial glia I showed you earlier, in the human brain, and suggested that maybe the virus was entering the fetus through that receptor. And this is what's called a heat map. It shows gene expression. What I wanted to highlight were, uh, was this receptor, AXL, and its expression. And each of these columns represents cells from a different part of the developing brain. And uh, what this shows us is that the ex expression of this receptor is not found straight across all cell types. It's restricted very specifically to this cell type, which are the radioglia neural stem cells I showed you, and astrocytes and endothelial cells, which are shown here. It's not expressed in neurons, for example, adult neurons, suggesting that the virus wasn't able to infect neurons, but only the progenitor cells that make the neurons. And later on in development in astrocytes, and that's what's shown here, a human astrocyte that's highly infected by the uh, Zika virus. So this led us to a screening test using astrocytes, human astrocytes in our laboratory, to find drugs that might actually prevent the infection. And uh, what we found first was that if we blocked the AXL receptor, uh, we could block the infection, and that made sense and reinforced or validated the idea that that was the receptor the virus was using. But those drugs are very harsh and couldn't be used in pregnancy. So we started another drug screen where we looked at over 6,000 compounds that were clinically approved and that could potentially be used in pregnancy. And what that showed us was that azithromycin, commonly used antibiotic, was also effective at blocking the replication of this virus in these uh, human cells. In fact, we organized a clinical trial in Brazil for the following season, uh, which unfortunately never got underway. I shouldn't say unfortunately exactly. It was because they didn't have enough cases to actually run the trial. And, and that was a very amazing uh, phenomenon that after the initial season when uh, this uh, Zika virus was really very prevalent and microcephaly was, uh, was uh, you know, r raging that part of, of Brazil, the following year there were almost no cases. And we were never able to run our trial because we didn't have enough patients. Now, one of the alternatives to using fetal tissue that you may have been hearing about has to do with organoids. And these are stem cell-derived tissues that have now been uh, produced for a whole range of different human cell types and organs. And the one, of course, that I want to emphasize uh, are the organoids that resemble the human brain or sometimes referred to as cerebral organoids. Uh, 
what, what that basically requires is you start with a pluripotent stem cell, a stem cell that can be any cell, can generate any cell in the body, and they often can be made now from skin cells or blood cells, so you don't need to use embryonic cells to start with. Once you make a cell line of that sort, you can then drive it down different lineages by adding different factors or extrinsic uh, small molecules. And the protocol that we're using is uh, one that takes these pluripotent cells and makes them into nerve progenitor cells. You can then allow them to aggregate, to clump together, and when that happens at the right stage, they begin to instruct themselves on how to develop. And you have a self-organizing structure that resembles, in this case, the developing human brain. And these are some uh, examples going from the pluripotent colony here of uh, pluripotent stem cells all the way to this cerebral organoid on the right, which consists mostly of four brain uh, cells that you find in a developing human fetus, for example. Uh, and these are cross sections with markers that are uh, showing the gene expression of these cells that are looking very much like second trimester, second trimester human brain development. But how closely do they actually resemble the, the fetal tissue? Uh, these are panels of cross sections of uh, actual human developing fetal brain at different stages that are roughly comparable to what these organoids reproduce. And these are beautifully, uh, exquisitely organized, they're laminated, uh, there are differences as you go from the front to the back of the brain. Uh, these are the normally developing cell types. The organoids look very different, and they're shown here at comparable stages. They have many of the same cell types, which I'll get to in a minute, but the organization clearly uh, leaves much to be desired. They're not laminar, they don't have the layered organization of normal brain, but the cell types that are produced are distributed almost randomly through, through these, uh, these organoid cultures. So they obviously don't have the structural organization of the developing human brain. They also lack certain critical cell types uh, that are diagrammed here, endothelial cells, which form the blood vessels, microglia, which are the kind of immune cells of the brain, and they're very difficult to generate astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, which are non-neural cells normally found in the developing brain. Um, those are part of the problem. The cell types aren't fully represented. There are also connections to other parts of the brain that help the brain develop and are very important for disease, and they're not found in these organoids either. They're not connected to sub-cerebral regions like the thalamus. They don't have projections to the spinal cord and so on. And they lack interneurons, which are very critical in forming the canonical circuits of the cortex. So they're a reductionist model, and they don't really re reproduce all the features of developing brain. But there's some good news for organoids, and, and the cerebral organoids shown here compared to fetal brain uh, represent all the major cell types at the appropriate stages of development. So you can get excitatory neurons, uh, astrocytes, the progenitor cells, including the radioglia, are present there. Uh, and they very much resemble uh, the major broad classes of cell types you find in uh, fetal brain. And that's shown here in a, a, a bioinformatic uh, diagram here where the cell types are clustered together. And, and the pink cells come from the organoids and the red cells come from fetal tissue and they're in a kind of a salt and pepper distribution because you can see each of these clusters uh, receives a contribution from both fetal cells and organoid cells. So the cell types are roughly comparable. But if we dive deeper into that, the roughly comparable situation is a little bit like the glass half full, which is also a glass that's half empty. And to emphasize the parts that don't fit, uh, I'm showing you here gene types that we find in fetal cells at these ages that define individual cell types. And we have about 600 such genes in the normally developing human brain. If we look at the organoids and look at the same kinds of genes, we only find 46 at comparable stages. And only five of them turn out to be the same genes in organoids as we find in fetal tissue. So the gene expression on an individual cell basis is dramatically different in these organoid cells. And if we look more carefully at that, we see that the diversity of cell types, which is shown roughly on this graph, is much higher in the fetal cells, which are shown here in sort of tan or orange, compared to the organoid cell types, which are in blue. What we really find is that the organoid produces an excitatory neuron that's a kind of a generic neuron. It doesn't have the precise identity of the different types of diverse cell types that you find in the normally developing brain. So it's a much simplified kind of neural tissue. The other problem is that these organoids are under metabolic stress. And that's shown here by these genes that are associated in a, in a network on the left and these uh, violin plots on the right show enrichment in these two genes in particular which are associated with stress and they're enriched across organoids from multiple different protocols. 
doesn't matter how you make these organoids, they're always going to have increased stress uh, uh, expression compared to fetal tissue, which are the first two lines here that have very, very low expression of these two genes. These endoplasmic reticulum network genes, which are under uh, high stress in the organoids, uh, can contribute to some of the phenotypes, some of the uh, observations that people make in organoids that they relate to diseases, when in fact it's not disease related, it could just be the organoids themselves are under this enormous amount of metabolic stress that you don't see in normal developing tissue. So you have to be very cautious when interpreting phenotypes of a disease based on an organoid, especially when you're modeling a metabolic disorder. Having indicated that there are shortcomings for the organoids, I do want to mention that we in our labs and labs around the world are very excited about organoids as a model of studying uh, human development in certain ways and diseases, and also I wanted to mention evolution. Uh, in my lab, we're very interested in comparing brains of, uh, of humans to other species, and so that immediately raises issues of evolution. What is it that makes the human brain unique, or is it unique? How is it different from our closest living relatives, which are the chimpanzees? And to do that study, uh, we, we didn't have fetal tissue from the fetal uh, chimpanzee, so we uh, instead turned to organoids. And we made organoids from humans and from chimps. Here are eight different chimpanzee lines, uh, individual chimpanzees, uh, 10 individual humans. We made pluripotent cells, made stem cell lines, drove them uh, using a protocol into this organoid uh, that resembles the forebrain of, uh, of brain development. And then we compared the chimpanzee organoids to the human organoids and looked at them from a cell-to-cell, cell-specific uh, cell comparison. And first I want to mention that my favorite cell type, that outer radial glia that I started to show you, uh, is expressed in organoids. This is a, a heat map that shows the genes that define that outer radial glial cell, and they emerge in organoids after about 10 weeks of growth. And to confirm that we had the same cell types, we looked at them the same way we did the fetal tissue shown here. This is an organoid a cell type that was made now from a, a stem cell, and if you watch it divide, it jumps and divides exactly like the fetal tissue. So those cell types are preserved in the organoids, and that allowed us to look at genes that were found in human cells, but not in the chimpanzee, that were therefore human-specific. And, and this is just a diagram that shows the high correlation between uh, genes found in the chimpanzee and in the human uh, that are expressed in outer radial glial cells. So they have many genes in common, but we're interested in the genes that are not held in common, and there, two of them are shown here on the right. Again, in these violin plots, they're highly enriched, these two genes, in uh, human, human primary fetal tissue and in human organoids, but not in the chimpanzee or in other non-human primates like the macaque. So we can now say that these are human-specific outer radial glia genes. They're found in human outer radial glia, but not in other non-human primates. And that gets me back uh, to this pathway I mentioned earlier, that mTOR signaling pathway that's in, in involved in autism. In this heat map, it highlights that these genes, which are uh, expressed in this pathway, are enriched in fetal human tissue, shown here. They're also enriched in human organoids, which is reassuring. It shows you the organoids do resemble uh, this aspect of normal development. Uh, but what you may also notice is they're not expressed in the macaque or the chimpanzee outer radial glial cells. So this tells us something we didn't know before. Not only is the mTOR pathway unique to the outer radial glial cell, it's only found in humans, so it's a human-specific feature. And that means if you're studying diseases based on mTOR signal, like perhaps autism, not only can't you model it in a mouse, you may not even be able to model it in non-human primates. You may need to use human cells in order to study that disease. And these outer radial glial cells also have other pathways that are unique, and I wanted to mention this one in particular, the LIFR STAT3 signaling pathway. You don't need to know what that means, but it's a pathway that allows these cells to proliferate. It's a self-renewal pathway. And it's expressed only by the outer radial glial cells, and it involves this receptor for, called LIF receptor, the leukemia inhibitory factor receptor. With that in mind, and knowing that the organoids we were growing didn't have very many of these outer radial glia, we added LIF to the cultures of organoids, which are shown here. And after two weeks, shown in red are the outer radial glial cells, vastly increased in number, because by activating this pathway, we were able to get them to self-renew. So using this, we can now grow organoids that are improved. They're, they have more of these progenitors that you find in uh, large numbers in the normally developing human brain. And then if you grow them beyond this age, you can start to see the cells that they produce, and, which are not usually represented in the organoids. So this 
highlights the fact that the organoid models are very new and they're still undergoing technical improvements. And there are many ways we can improve those organoids and eventually get them to resemble, better resemble fetal tissue. But until we get there, we need to use the fetal tissue as our gold standard for what these organoids are supposed to be doing. Now these raise several uh, questions that are ethical and that <clears throat> I think we'll discuss later on in, in today's sessions. First of all, these organoids are uh, in a way uh, miniature brains. They're sometimes referred to as mini brains. They have all the problems that I've mentioned earlier, but in addition, they're very, very small. And if you compare them in size to the human brain, the largest organoids are shown here on this little dot up here in the left. And so if you ever worry about these organoids uh, becoming a, a thinking brain, uh, the, the likelihood is very, very tiny. In fact, uh, to have proper sentience, even if the, these organoids were properly organized, you probably need a much larger mass than, than what these tiny little uh, pieces of tissue represent. So they're probably not large enough or sufficiently organized or complex enough to even begin to worry about whether they're able to think. Other issues that have been raised about organoids is uh, whether they have any form of perception. Now these organoids sometimes grow with an eye attached, and, and that's diagrammed here. Uh, it turns out that the signals that produce a forebrain are very similar to the ones that produce the eye, which is essentially an extension of part of the nervous system. And so some of the organoids actually will have little retina tissue shown here in the middle of an organoid that otherwise has brain tissue. And that led uh, Paolo Arlotta at Harvard to, to see whether she could shine a light on these organoids and see a response. And that's what's shown down here in response to light. The neurons in this organoid actually, which are very active at rest, shut down. So when the light comes on, the activity goes away. And then you turn the light off and the activity comes back. So that's not really perception, but that is a light response, a sensory response that these organoids are, are beginning to be capable of. Uh, it's abnormal. Normally, light would activate the cells instead of inhibiting them, as shown here. Uh, but nonetheless, they're responding to a sensory stimulus. And that raises the possibility that down the road, we might have an organoid that could uh, have sensations of some sort. The other feature is that these organoids can have rhythmic activity, uh, synchronized rhythmic activity. And that's shown here, where spontaneously, after uh, growing them for about three months, you can see these little bursts of activity, which uh, are not too dissimilar to bursts of activity that you see in an EEG, an electroencephalogram uh, from a preemie or a newborn baby, which is shown above. Now, I think the fact that they look similar uh, has been misinterpreted to think that the uh, reasons that these are being generated are the same. And I don't think that. I think these organoids are, as I mentioned earlier, lacking some very important connections that drive the activity in the normal brain shown here. So they have a superficial resemblance, and you can tweak them to make them look more similar, uh, but they're really not the same. Nonetheless, it raises the possibility that in the future, you might have an organoid that could have some form of synchronized activity that might resemble the kind of brain activity that you see in a normally developing human brain. And finally, can these organoids integrate if you transplant them into another animal? And that was done by Rusty Gage uh, in his laboratory at San Diego. He took these organoids that were growing in a laboratory, uh, human organoids, and put them into the brain of a mouse. And what's shown here is that they survived in the brain of the mouse, uh, but they didn't fully integrate. On the other hand, the blood vessels from the mouse grew into the organoid, and that's what's shown here, and perfused the organoid, potentially allowing it to grow larger than it would in a laboratory dish. And this project, this, which is really very rudimentary, raised a, another set of ethical issues, uh, having to do with whether we could humanize the mouse by injecting or, or transplanting or surgically grafting human brain cells into the mouse. Um, but these cells are not integrated into the mouse. They're not functioning the way uh, any of the brain cells in the mouse normally do. And they're not contributing to any features of the mouse, behaviorally or cognitively. Um, and, and, and we're a long ways from getting them to fully integrate. On the other hand, um, there's been an interesting project, experiment that was done already by Steve Goldman a number of years ago, where he took one human cell type, which are the non-neural uh, astrocytes uh, from a developing human fetus, in fact, and he injected them into the uh, early developing mouse brain. And they distributed throughout the brain of this developing mouse and took over from the normal astrocytes that the mouse makes. So there were no more mouse astrocytes. They were really completely dominated by these human astrocytes, which are quite different than the mouse cells. They're bigger, they're more highly branched. And what was really curious, and here you can see that they're uh, completely dominating the forebrain of this mouse. Uh, in behavioral tests, these were smarter mice. Uh, 
than normal. And that made a big splash, the fact that you could put these one cell types from the human brain into a mouse and improve cognition. <clears throat> but I would point out that these um, are laboratory reared mice. And it's been shown that inbred laboratory mice are in fact dumber than your average mouse that's out in the wild. And so the possibility exists that what they really did was just uh, bring this dumber laboratory mouse up to the level of a normal mouse. And a study like this really needs to be done in wild type mice, literally the ones that are running around in the, in the woods, to see if it makes a difference. Um, but it does raise an interesting question for the future about whether uh, we, would, we, we have an ethical barrier here that we shouldn't cross. And then the final thing I wanted to mention were uh, human-animal chimeras. Uh, now, chimeras have uh, existed in, in mythology. Uh, you go to the internet, you can find some very interesting examples. Uh, but in reality, uh, these are uh, chimeras produced in a laboratory. These are mice that have rat cells, and these are rats that have mouse cells. So these are uh, crosses between these two species that have been engineered in a laboratory. Aside from just uh, sort of sprinkling cells of one type into the body or brain of another type, uh, there's another more intriguing project that's underway in several labs around the world that's diagrammed here. You can take a, a blastocyst, uh, essentially a, a developing egg that's fertilized from a pig in a laboratory, just like you do IVF with human patients. You can fertilize that and then you can actually genetically engineer it to, for example, remove one of the genes that's responsible for an organ's development. In this case, a gene has been removed that would normally produce a pancreas. So this embryo, when it's re-implanted in a pregnant pig, grows up into a little piglet, will be a piglet that lacks a pancreas, has no pancreas, because the uh, critical gene that allows you to grow a pancreas in the pig is missing. So that pig will die. On the other hand, if you take that same blastocyst before you re-implant it into a pregnant pig, uh, if you inject human embryonic stem cells or pluripotent stem cells into that, uh, that uh, pig embryo, what will happen is that the human cells will integrate with the pig cells and all the organs of the pig will have some human cell types sprinkled through them. But the pancreas, because the pancreas wouldn't develop in this pig, it, it's lacking the uh, genes for uh, developing a pig pancreas, those human cells will reproduce the pancreas. So you'll have a pig born with a human pancreas. It'll be a living pig. Um, but that human pancreas is a potential organ donor. That is, you could potentially uh, donate that organ to a human uh, who, who might uh, be suffering from type 1 diabetes, for example. Now, there are some problems because the uh, pig blood system and endothelial cells invades that organ. And so the perfusion, the blood cells and the endothelial cells in that organ are actually from the pig. So you will have a an, uh, a pancreas that has some pig cells as well as human cells. But again, this, this is an uh, experiment that's already been done in uh, rodents, and there are people who are working on this for heart and for liver and for um, pancreas in pigs right now. So this raises, again, another set of ethical issues, which is what I wanted to leave you with for the discussion later on today. And just a few of these issues, when it comes to fetal tissue research, one of the key issues is when does an embryo or a fetus actually become a person? When does it have rights and, and, and uh, personhood, as it were? Uh, in terms of the chimeras, um, do organs grown in pigs raise issues for transplantation? Even though they're 90% human tissues, uh, is there uh, ethical reason or concern? And does it differ depending on what organ we're talking about? And should there be a red line around uh, human uh, functions in animals? That is, uh, how much uh, should we tolerate when we put human cells into animal models? W would, would it uh, be a, a, a red line we don't want to cross if cognition, uh, motor behavior, or speech were humanized in an animal model, whether it's a large brain mammal like a pig or even a mouse? Um, so these are questions that are not just theoretical. I think they're based on uh, science that's been progressing very, very rapidly. And I think it's a very appropriate and timely uh, for us to consider some of these issues now uh, before we've quite reached the threshold of actually doing these experiments. So that was the introduction I wanted to give you, and uh, thank you for your attention.